the last three days before the flight to Cape Discovery have been taken up with mostly with packing my food, the tent, the sleeping bag, the clothing, the skis, the boots, the poles, uh, making sure all of it is, is ready to go. The weight of the sled effectively dictates my pace over the ice, so that the lighter the sled is, the more weight we can save, um, the easier it is for me to pull, the faster I can go. So I've become pretty obsessive about saving weight where we can. I mean, the sledge itself is, is made from Kevlar and, and carbon fibre, super lightweight. And we've done everything from cutting the labels out of my clothing to uh, cutting the metal tabs off zips to uh, you know, freeze drying all of my food. Uh, I've cut the handle off my toothbrush. So uh, there's not much we haven't done to, to save weight. The sledge or the pulk is a beautiful sort of organic design. It's got no straight edges, no sharp corners. So it sort of flows through um, the smashed up rubble ice and over these big pressure ridges. It's extremely light. It's uh, this sled is, is about six or seven kilos, and I'm going to be pulling more than ten times that inside it. So incredible strength to, to weight ratio. It's a bit like an eggshell. It's designed to be very strong in certain directions and, and, and very weak in others. So it's from the sides you can sort of squeeze it together and flex it. You can see um, daylight through the through the Kevlar. My skis have strips of fabric on the bottom called skins, uh, and normally they're, they're used for people to travel up mountains and then they take the skins off at the top and, and ski down again. Now I'm never going to be skiing downhill, I'm just dragging stuff along so my skins need to be permanently attached. So they're glued onto the base of the skis but as well as that we actually put small screws in to hold them in place. I use a two-man tent um, just for me on my own because I've got quite a lot of kit, obviously the, the sleeping bag and the clothing things are all pretty bulky and uh, even that goes through the, the weight saving ringer so we've, we've cut metal tabs off the zips. We've just replaced all the uh, the guy lines around the outside of the tent with some very thin uh, spectra cord to save 60 grams in total, which I'm quite excited about. Uh, no mosquitoes in the Arctic, so we've cut out the, the mosquito nets. The rope that connects me to the, the sled uh, is called trace. Um, there's quite a lot of it. I think I've got um, about eight metres of trace. Now, I don't normally ski with a sledge that far behind me, but what it allows me to do is, is sort of loop it up so the sledge is, is normally quite close. And then if I come to an obstacle, I can unloop the trace so I can clamber up the up the ridge or over the water or whatever the obstacle is and, and then pull the sledge over after me and then sort of hook it back up again. I'd be foolish to head out there without, without some form of bare defence. Um, I have uh, bangers, um, flares essentially, and I also have a, a shotgun. Which isn't the lightest, you know, it'd be lighter to have a, I don't know, a pistol or something, but um, the shotgun's pretty foolproof. Um, it's, it, it works well in, in very low temperatures and, it, and it's easy to use with big uh, mittens on. It's a sort of all or nothing strategy that the record I'm aiming for is 36 days, 22 hours, uh, 35 days of food, not much room to uh, stretch it out beyond 35 days, so it's so, um, all or nothing. It's been amazing to, to think about the, the, the amount of work and effort and time that's gone into each little bag of food, seeing them all land up on the floor. The freeze-dried food is uh, specially made by a tiny company in Portsmouth called Fusion, um, so they've completely custom-made uh, my breakfasts and, and, and the main meals every evening. Andy's worked for hours weighing drinks powders and, and breaking up little bars of chocolate and wrapping things in cling film. We were trying to work out today whether it was lighter to keep the, the freeze-dried meals in their original packaging or, or whether to transfer it into a uh, sort of double layer of freezer bags and um, it actually worked out in the end that it wasn't going to save us a, a thing so we've kept it in the original packaging but we've, we've cut the corners off which saved 23 grams I think in total. Most of the weight in this load is, is, is food but the next big biggest chunk of weight is fuel for my stove so I, I have the cooker on every morning every evening in the tent uh, to melt enough snow to get my drinking water and it takes a long time when it's, when it's very very cold to get water from uh, snow at, at you know, minus 40 to, uh, to boiling water. Well, the stove burns a, a fuel, the Canadians call it white gas. It's essentially, uh, it's a liquid fuel, it's a bit like petrol, it sort of burns with a, you know, a very fierce blue flame. Uh, it's pretty toxic, pretty pretty corrosive stuff. Um, I had big problems last year, well, an expedition forced to an end last year through a fuel leak in my sledge. So we've got this year um, some aluminium fuel bottles with pretty strong lids. Um, we found they had a sort of rubber grip thing on the lid that, that was superfluous so we cut those out to save a few grams. I know from experience that the ice um, at 
the start on the Canadian side is, is going to be pretty smashed up. Uh, essentially, the, the currents of the Arctic Ocean are, are pushing the pack ice uh, into the north coast of Canada and of Greenland as well. So, so it kind of crumples up. You get these big ridges at the start. Towards the end of the expedition, as it, as it gets warmer, um, you know, for most of April, it'll be 24-hour daylight. Uh, and, and certainly, when you get close to the pole, it'll be minus 10, minus 5. Um, and then it, everything starts melting. So I, I fully expect to see open water at the end. And another kind of misconception I think people have is, is the first one is that everything's white, which is not true. You know, the first the first week or two, I probably w- w- won't really see any white. Um, the second misconception is, is that it's silent. You know, so it must be a, must be really strange, you know, being that quiet. When you're moving during the day, it's really noisy. Everything, because it's so cold, the, the snow makes this incredible sort of squeaking noise. Um, you know, the skis, the ski falls getting into it, the sledge dragged over it, so there's a lot of a lot of noise. At night, um, you know, the wind blowing the tent, occasionally you hear the ice itself moving, and, and there's this incredible um, range from, from sort of deep, you know, booming, rumbling, to um, sort of very high-pitched squeaking and, and whining. And people always are, you know, say, oh, don't you get bored of all that white? You know, it's, it's stunning, absolutely beautiful place. Um, and it's so difficult to convey that, in particularly when you're there on your own. You know, I know because it's, it's sea ice, it's always moving, the stuff that I'm seeing, is unique to me. You know, come out the next day, it'll look completely different. I think it's 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 interesting how our role sort of changed so much. You know, as soon as I'm dropped off, my life becomes really really simple. You know, um, I'm sort of unplugged from society. I have one daily phone call to Andy every day, and that's it. There's no current affairs, no gossip, no news, um, no radio, no TV. So I'm sort of unplugged, and, and all I have to do is head in the right direction stay warm keep eating keep sleeping and, and that's it but even though I'm alone on the ice the word solo is a misnomer there, there, there are so many people that have worked so hard to make this happen that it's not only exciting but it's quite humbling to be here about to set off